Native culture, Native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international Native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier Native voice in Native programming. There's a heartbeat Heartbeat Alaska. Here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska and happy holidays, everyone. Hello to you, New Stuyahawk, Alaska. Glad to have you with us. New Stuyahawk, Alaska is a Yupik village located in southwestern Alaska. Hello, Arizona. Navajo Nation TV5 is located in Window Rock, Arizona. It's the home of Navajo Nation Tribal TV, a television station that serves over a quarter million tribal members of the Navajo Nation. Thank you, Keelong, for your contribution today of the AIDS Awareness March held in that state. In this state, in Alaska, the Rural Providers Conference was held. We covered some hot topics of that conference. Here's John Active. With Native news across the country, I'll be back right after that, so don't go away. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by the Division of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse and the Alaska Council on Prevention of Alcohol and Drug Abuse. Together, preventing substance abuse statewide. And by Youth Air Alaska, official airlines of Heartbeat Alaska. Ute Air Alaska, taking you home. Contact Heartbeat Alaska with your news. Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. That's Heartbeat Alaska, 5861 Arctic Boulevard, Unit B, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call at 1-907-563-7440 or fax us at 1-907-563-9309. Heartbeat Alaska, your news is our news. Today's show is packed with news. Let's get started. Beginning with John Active with his report for Heartbeat Alaska, Native news across the country. Here's John Active from Bethel, Alaska. Welcome to Native News Across the Country. I'm John Active. Good news for subsistence hunters of migratory birds in Alaska and Canada. The U.S. Senate has approved changes to the Migratory Bird Treaty between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Canada also has approved the amendments, and the Mexican government is in the process of approving them. Previously, the treaty banned hunting ducks, geese, and other birds from March 10th to September 1st, but natives largely ignored the ban and continued their subsistence hunts. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that about 300,000 birds were harvested for subsistence in rural Alaska during the mid-1980s. The changes will recognize the subsistence harvests that occur in Alaska and Canada every year. The legal battle by Canada's Indian women to keep their native status when they marry non-natives has landed in the nation's Supreme Court. Native groups want the High Court to uphold the constitutionality of 1985 changes to the Indian Act. After those changes were approved, thousands of women were able to regain their Indian status, but many still found themselves barred from becoming band members by chiefs and councils. One native group, led by conservative Senator Walter Twin, claimed the amendments were unconstitutional and took the matter to court in 1993. Recently, the Federal Court of Appeals ruled that the judge who heard the case, Justice Francis Muldoon, displayed a reasonable apprehension of bias in his ruling. Whatever we're trying to do now is to get the Supreme Court to say that the amendments were constitutionally correct and once this decision is done
done, then First Nations across the country cannot discriminate against women. They'll have to include them in their bands. Ovide Mercedes, former Grand Chief of the Assembly of the First Nations, said on the steps of the Supreme Court before filing appeal paperwork. Mercedes was among those who regained official status under the legislation. Before the legislation, if an Indian brother or sister married out of the band, the brother's wife and children got Indian rights, but the sister lost her status, and her husband and children never got status. Ironize Cody, the crying Indian, whose tear-streaked face was used in a popular anti-litter campaign in the 1970s, is being used in a new environmental commercial for the nonprofit group Keep America Beautiful. The 30-second television ad filmed in Stamford shows compute commuters littering as they board a bus. Cody's face appears on a poster on the side of a bus shelter. It is an image that appeared in the 1970s, which shows a single tear streaming down his face. In the 1970s, one of the things that face launched was environmentalism in general, said Ivan Jones of Keep America Beautiful, headquartered in Stamford. The commercial should be ready for broadcast by the end of the year, but television networks would have to voluntarily run it. And finally, it's the holidays, Halloween without candy, Thanksgiving without turkey, and Christmas without cookies. For many, the holidays just wouldn't be complete without the seasonal food and drink prepared and enjoyed with families, friends, and coworkers. Yet, if thoughts of indulging festive goodies have you fretting about possible holiday weight gain, take note. Taking time to prepare for a festive eating season can help you identify ways to help make your holiday a little bit more healthy. Thinking ahead, planning and being prepared is probably the biggest thing that will get you through the holidays without gaining a few extra pounds along the way, said Sybil Gautreaux, clinical nutri nutritionist and registered dietitian with the University of Washington Medical Center. The holiday season doesn't have to be a time of deprivation, but moderation is a good idea. The best approach to altering eating habits should include a combination of limiting the amount of foods you eat, altering recipes with healthy substitutions, and removing tempting foods from your reach. Being a smart social eater doesn't mean that you have to deprive yourself, stresses control. You can have an enjoyable holiday season by planning ahead for those occasions when you'll control your food consumption, then allowing yourself to splurge at others. That's a good idea, I think, but that makes me hungry reading that story. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm John Active. Thank you, John Active. We look forward to your next report. We travel now to Window Rock, Arizona, Navajo Nation TV5 sent us this report on an AIDS awareness march. You know, AIDS in Africa is an ep epidemic. And it's very sad to see those little babies to be born and then wait to die. It's very sad, but that's how it's affecting people in Africa. And we need to do whatever we can here in our part of the country, here on Navajo Nation. If anything, we need to educate the people about HIV and AIDS. And uh, I always say when I was with the program, we need to educate our leaders we need to educate, uh, bring this subject into the tr uh, tribal chambers and make people aware uh, about this uh, uh, disease and how they can help as far as uh, in their position as, as leaders. So good to hear from you, Navajo Nation TV5. And we can't wait for your next video. Keep them coming, would you? Let's travel now to back to Anchorage, Alaska. The World Providers Conference was held here recently. And this is something I would like to open and I know that we have subsistence program in the Department of Interior that we need to coordinate something to finance some of these issues for us, especially when the state is pounding down on our necks. Arnold Brower Jr. flew in from Barrow, along with hundreds of others from around the state. 
the annual Rural Providers Conference provided a forum to air views on hot topics such as subsistence and the Venati case. Yes, the BIA is representing my people for their own land and the way they want to control their own land. I, I, I'm sure that probably we're going to lose that uh, case and compromise these other little things. Yes, you'll always have some sort of control, but you'll never really control your land. I think the next step for people that represent us is to go to, un to the United Nations, those people outside, to look at us from the outside world, other indigenous people, to protect us on that last very important issue, if the bearer of Indian affairs can uh, really protect our rights in this Vinatai case. issue in the Venati case is whether native tribes in Alaska have the same broad governmental powers as Indian tribes on reservations in the lower 48. Next Wednesday, arguments will be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. This case is considered to be monumentally important. It all began in 1986 when the native tribe in Venati, Alaska attempted to tax a state school contractor. Then, last November 9th, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals declared that Venati had the right to tax. So, the state of Alaska and the Knowles administration dug deep and came up with $1 million war chest to fight the decision. The Venati Indian Country case is probably Alaska's biggest Supreme Court case ever, according to the state's two most recent attorneys general. just in time. Hi, I'm Jenny Green. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska's Christmas Special. Greetings from all over the state. Amy Brooks, Alaskan athlete. I did a rod musher. Tobacco free. Come to where the freedom is. Choose to be tobacco free. Join us now for a special video presentation, Barrow, Alaska, vintage video of Barrow in the 1930s. Compliments of the North Slope Borough. Fifty years ago, the economy at Barrow was based largely on hunting and little else. And so it was in 1936 that Fred and Nan Clara Cooper first saw the place that was to be home for the next nine years. Fred Clara Cooper was the Presbyterian minister on the North Slope from 1936 to 1945. Most of the pictures in this film were taken by the Clara Copers, And most of the words spoken here were written by them. Although the Presbyterian Church had been in barrel since before the turn of the century, it did not extend to many of the outlying scattered settlements. Fred Clara Cooper ministered to all of the places that, today, comprise the North Slope Borough. Nan remembers the first time that she and Fred saw their new home after a 36-day trip on the North Star from Seattle. We woke up the next morning after nosing through the ice most of the night to see the gray shores of Barrow, as always on these low-lying lands. The houses seemed to be built right on the water and zoomed up big and gray. 
our house, especially, seems perfectly huge. We had no sunshine that day, September 5th. But things began to happen as soon as we got a little closer to the shore. There was so much going on, we didn't notice the cloudy weather. The pictures I have of Eskimos of the North Slope I seen through the eyes of a Presbyterian minister. I came to admire and love the Eskimo who made his home in one of the harshest environments known to man. I admired his ability to adapt to the environment which demanded from him so much and which repaid him frequently by taking his life if he made a mistake. I lived with him at times in his igloo, rode his kayak and umiak, wore his fur clothes, drove his dog sled, shot the seals, walrus, and polar bear of his land, and hunted the whale with him. I saw him in the light of his joys and sorrows, and how he reacted to them. My parish was 600 miles long, on the northernmost rim of Alaska. It stretched from the little village of Wainwright at 110 miles southwest to demarcation point, the Canada-Alaska boundary, 500 miles southeast. Everything is south of Point Barrow on the North American continent, except an uninhabited corner of the Boothia Peninsula in Canada. At that time, the means of travel or locomotion in the Arctic was the dog. The snowmobile was still too experimental a machine to be depended upon, whereas the dog could be. These are huskies, or malamutes, and these puppies inherited a natural desire to pull. They had a wonderful stability and ability to run and keep running all day. They slept out at temperatures 50 or 60 degrees below zero, curling their big bushy tails up over their noses to keep warm. In Barrow, we hooked up the dogs in tandem, usually in teams of six, with the leader in front. This was the snowmobile which I called Roaring Boring Alice, for the Aurora Borealis. I had just returned from demarcation point for one trip that this snowmobile took to that post. Alice was the first snowmobile in Arctic Alaska. We hauled about a ton of ice blocks at a time behind the snowmobile. This we melted for drinking water. In the years 1936 to 1945, Burrow was still one of the far-flung places of the Earth. The airplane was just beginning to invade the Eskimo homeland. To us, living in the Arctic in the late 30s, the airplane spelled speed and comfort after years of the cold, lumbering pace of the dog sled. Sailors. Traders and missionaries preceded the airplane. Before their coming, life had been quite stable, even with its difficulties. There was little to change or disrupt the lifestyle. Most of the people were ambitious and hardworking. They all were very easygoing, pleasant people. Physically, most had chronic problems 
Had we any woman weighed over 135 pounds, almost all of them had just had a baby, or were about to have one. Many houses were poorly built because wood was so very scarce. Wooden canvas houses were frequently blocked up with snow to keep them warm, snow being a good insulator. This is the church. It was built in 1910 after the first church burned. It was enlarged in 1915 when the steeples were added. brought what they could as tithing offerings, few had any cash. Over the years, the church became the social as well as the religious center of Beryl. From earliest times, man has had to be a hunter to survive. Hunting has been the Eskimo's way of staying alive and providing for his family. Hunting is still a means to a basic food supply and not a relief from everyday tasks. Eskimos have been essentially meat eaters. Hunting has been their work, and few people have adapted to the difficulties of that work as has the Eskimo in one of the most difficult environments known to man. In days gone by, the hunter was, of necessity, a roamer, and led a hunting, roaming life. The changes of season and the habits of the animals necessitated movement. Because the coastal Eskimo found more game in the sea than on the land, he often made his home on the coast. The Umiak, a large open skin-covered boat, was and still is used to hunt sea animals. In the 1930s, the framework was made of driftwood that floats around Point Barrow from the mouths of the Mackenzie and Colville rivers. Its ribs were mortised into gunnel and keel and pinned with wooden pegs. Lashing was sometimes used. Wood was scarce and precious in the years 1936 to 1945. It was collected along the beach for miles around Barrow. After a storm, the beach was combed for driftwood for keels, handles for tools, and sled runners, and the like. At Barrow, the skin of the uka, or bearded seal, is about the right thickness for covering the umiak. South of Barrow, where the uka is scarce, walrus skin is used. God did not make seals square, so the skins have to be cut straight. The skin-covered umiak is ideally suited to the Arctic environment. It is lighter than a wooden boat of the same size. It bends and gives when it strikes an iceberg or a large sea mammal. The kayak was also covered with ugrak skin, and a double-ended paddle was used. Whale hunting provided a large source of food and fuel in the years 1936 to 1945. It is a task for the courageous only, and time and again, the Eskimo has proven himself. The Greenland right whales, or bowheads, are known as baleen whales. These whales have plates of baleen in their mouths with thin, hair-like edges that act as skids and through which they feed. Principal foods are plankton and krill. During the 18th and 19th century, the baleen was very valuable and was used in the center of buggy whips and for stays in the making of ladies' dresses and corsets. Camping on the edge of the ice, the whaling crew used only one tent if possible. Gear was kept to a minimum in case the ice broke off between them and the shore 
and escape was necessary. When a whale had been killed, a flag was mounted on the highest piece of ice to announce the victory, and other crews and people from the village dropped whatever they were doing to help the fortunate crew tow the catch to the edge of the shore ice and cut it up. Thank you so much for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska, Native News and Native Entertainment. I'm Jeannie Green. Looking forward to your video, your Christmas greetings. Please get your camcorder out. It's one hour of fun. You'll love it. This is our sixth annual Christmas special. Get me video from your village as well, and we'll do a story, if, especially if we haven't heard from you. We love to hear from you. Give us a call, 1-907-563-7440. God bless you. I'm Jeannie Green. We'll see you again next week.